Leviticus 19, 9 and 10, and then 33 and 34. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vine, vineyard, vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. And when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall do him no wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And then turn over to Acts chapter 4. We'll be reading Acts 30, chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. Acts chapter 4. Verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of these things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ruth, chapter 2. If you're using your pew Bibles in front of you, you can find it on page 222. We're going to be, again, reading Ruth, chapter 2 today. And our passage drops us right into the middle of some pretty desperate times. When we last left Ruth and Naomi, their situation was was dark and bleak. They were in trouble after 10 years of sojourning in a foreign land outside of Israel's borders in the land called Moab. Naomi's family has been tragically reduced to just her and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, Now they're back in Israel, Naomi, an aging widow, Ruth, both a widow and a foreigner. At this point in time, when chapter 2 is about to take off, their, their family is in dire straits. Their future is uncertain. At the end of chapter one, like we heard last week, we were left longing for a redeemer. We are, are left longing for someone who can come and make the situ- situation right, who can rescue them from their moments of distress. But that longing in our hearts raises a question. We're, we're longing for a redeemer, but what kind of redeemer might they actually get? What, what kind of redeemer are they going to get? Will the person who intervenes actually help them? Or will this person actually make the situation worse? Too often in our lives, we see that the person who swoops in to save save the day actually does more harm than good. You, you're familiar with this trope. We see it all the time in our pop culture uh, references, movies, TVs, books. Most of our modern heroes are tragically flawed heroes. Most of our heroes are morally ambiguous. Sometimes they're just downright bad. Sometimes, as the world teaches us, sometimes the hero that you get isn't really the one you want. And that's not just a modern phenomenon. It's not just a product of living in a cynical age. This problem of flawed heroes goes all the way back to the early days in the Bible, like the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, more often than not, the person who saves the day turns out to be a hero with significant flaws, who tends to make the situation just as bad, if not a little bit worse. We could think of Samson. Samson, a mighty warrior, Uh, but also someone with a ferocious temper who has a penchant for visiting prostitutes and marrying Philistines. It's not exactly the ideal redeemer in that case. Or take Gideon. Gideon is described as a worthy man, a man of valor in Judges 6, and yet Gideon is often indecisive and afraid. He does the right thing, but then he hides afterwards. He questions God's leading. He demands multiple signs for confirmation. Now, he does go out and defeat Israel's enemies, 
But then as a reward, he asks for certain trinkets of gold. He melts down the gold and makes a religious relic that leads the people into idolatry. Often the hero that you get isn't the one you really want. That's the tension hanging over Ruth 2 this morning. We long for a redeemer. What kind of redeemer are we going to get? Let's read, at, read on and find out. Turn your attention with me to Ruth chapter 2. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes? that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner. But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done. And a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also, pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city, her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth, the Moabite said, besides, he said to me, you shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. 
Our Lord, we thank you for this word, uh, a, a word of grace, a glimpse of an attractive redeemer. And we pray that you would speak to us now, cultivate in us the proper longing for a redeemer, a redeemer that we not only want, but one that we also deeply need. Please bless us through this word and turn our hearts to Christ through his spirit, we pray, amen. So again, this text is about longing for a redeemer, and not just any kind of redeemer, but a good one. We need a good redeemer. The narrator of this masterful, delightful story immediately points our attention to a possible candidate. There's a man in town, a man who is a relative of Naomi's. His name is Boaz, and apparently, according to the narrator, he is a worthy man. Now, that word worthy can mean many different things. It's used throughout the Bible many different ways. It could mean wealthy. It could mean mighty in battle, a man of valor. It might mean respected in the community, someone with great social standing. It could be someone who is morally virtuous. It's unclear what it means here in this text. The same word a man of worth, a worthy man, is used to describe Gideon in chapter 6 of the book of Judges, and we just heard that he wasn't really the best of heroes, and so immediately we're wondering what kind of a man is Boaz? He is worthy, but how? We're not sure because the narrator immediately goes away from it. You've got to love the suspense that's created in this. Here's a worthy man. Now let's focus back on Ruth and Naomi. And when we focus on Ruth and Naomi, we hear again a brief word about their situation. It's very, very dire. Chapter 2, verse 2, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean. And within that phrase right there, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean. It's a perfect picture of what they're going through. And what they're going through is profound need. That one sentence just raises up a profound need that they're going through. Gleaning was reserved for people who were in extreme poverty. In the Old Testament times, if you didn't have enough to eat, you couldn't go to a food bank like we have now. You would depend on the generosity of your neighbors. And that's where the gleaning laws came in. We've heard one of them already from the book of Leviticus. In Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God gives instructions for farmers how to be generous with their neighbors. He tells farmers to leave food in the fields so that people in poverty can come and harvest some for themselves. So in Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, God says, leave the edges of your fields unharvested. Don't go and, and take from the same row twice to make sure that you got everything. If you drop some grain on the ground, don't pick it up. If you pick some sheaves of grain and forget them back on the ground, don't go back and get them. Leave them for the poor for the widow, and for the sojourner. In other words, leave them for someone exactly like Ruth. Now, we might call these gleaning laws reasonable generosity, or as, as Christopher Ash puts it, generosity within sensible limits. God is saying, look, go ahead and make your harvest, get your food, just don't be stingy. Don't be a miser. Don't take every possible morsel, but leave some for those in need. And so if Ruth is thinking about gleaning, we immediately know that they are desperately poor. They're, they're desperately poor and in need of some intervention for their daily needs. Now, gleaning is going to help with that need, but gleaning is then going to create another need along the way, the need for safety, Gleaning depended on the generosity of your neighbors, but gleaning also depended on the integrity of your neighbors. If you were gleaning, you immediately signaled that you were vulnerable and you were a person that could be taken advantage of. An open field was a dangerous place for a single woman if ungodly men were around. And remember, this is the time of the judges. And so ungodly men are around everywhere you look in the time of judges. Uh, and so the people would normally, the women would normally band together to go out in the fields to glean, teaming up. But Ruth is a foreigner. 
Chapter 2 reminds us that. Verse 2, Ruth the Moabite. She's not going to have any community support. She's not going to have any friends to go out in the field to make it safer. She's going to be alone, and that's dangerous, and the text knows it. The text makes sure that we know it too multiple times. It references the danger that Ruth is in in that moment. Naomi explicitly says it in verse 22, stay in Boaz's field, lest in another field you be assaulted. Yes, there is profound need here. There's need for provision. There's need for community, need for safety. If I could sum it up in one word, there's need for grace. There's need for grace. Ruth needs grace, and she knows it. In verse 2, she says that she wants to find someone in whose sight I shall find favor, or as the King James Version puts it, in whose sight I shall find grace. She's looking for grace in a time of need. Will she get it? Again, we're not sure. Like a good storyteller, the narrator keeps us in suspense. In the meantime, while she's looking for grace, Ruth gets to work. And surprise, surprise, verse, chapter, er, verse 3, she, she just happened to come into the part of the field belonging to Boaz. Uh, this is just such a coincidence. In fact, the the Hebrew text bends over backwards to show how not on purpose it was that she came to Boaz's field. The Hebrew literally says her chance chanced upon it. Or as, as another scholar translates it, by sheer luck she came into Boaz's field. Of course, as as good readers of the Bible, we know that nothing happens by chance or by luck, but we're going to come back to that later. For now, just enjoy the ride that the story is taking us on. Ruth happens to come into Boaz's field, and then look who happens to show up. Verse 4, and behold, Boaz, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. What good timing. And now we're going to get to see what kind of a man Boaz really is. He's a worthy man. Will he act worthily? His first words give us a clue to his character. The first words out of his mouth, the Lord be with you. What a way to greet your workers your hired laborers, he, this man offers them a profound blessing. The Lord, the God of Israel, be with you. That's a great way to start out. It it's, uh, gives us hope that possibly Boaz is going to be a perfect redeemer, a perfect person for Ruth and for Naomi. If that's how he treats his employers, then there's hope for Ruth. And that's where the situation turns immediately. Boaz goes over to the job foreman and he says in verse 5, whose young woman is this? Meaning whose family does she belong to? Who's she with? And the answer is no one. Verse 6, she's the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. In other words, Ruth is a nobody. She's a poor widow with no household name. She's a foreigner, a Moabite from Moab, a neighboring enemy. How is Boaz going to react to this Moabite from Moab gleaning in his field, taking up all that extra food that was maybe on hold for the the other good Israelites? How is he going to react to the fact that this woman has been in the field from early morning gleaning, gleaning, gleaning? Well, over the next several verses, Boaz shows Ruth astounding grace. Boaz shows Ruth astounding grace. He treats her with dignity. Verse 8, he walks up right to her. Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter. My daughter. That's how an older man would respectfully address a younger woman. Immediately, Boaz is tender and protecting with her. He gives her community. Verse 8, keep close to my young women. Literally, cling to my young women. The same word that we heard last week is how Ruth clings to Naomi. It's a word that signals a, a relationship and a commitment. He's inviting Ruth to attach herself to 
to his people, cling to them. He guarantees her safety. Verse nine, have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And he even gives her honor at the end of verse 9. When you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn up. That is absolutely incredible. Normally in that society, a foreigner would draw water for an Israelite. And a woman would draw water for a man. And Boaz upends all of those social customs. He says, you, a Moabite woman, go and drink from the water that the Israelite men have drawn up. Instead of using water to reinforce gender, class, and racial differences, Boaz uses water to reinforce his hospitality and his welcome of this woman, this needy woman, into his care. And then the hospitality just continues in this amazing mealtime scene. It's just one verse, but it is overflowing with grace and generosity and hospitality. Verse 14, and at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers And he passed to her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. And so just picture what's going on here. Ruth probably doesn't have any food. That's why she's gleaning. She doesn't have lunch. And so the team, everyone in the field is going to break for lunch. She kind of comes on near the fringes. And Boaz says to her, no, 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 don't stay on the fringes. You come over here, come into the circle, sit next to all of the people. And then when she's there, he makes sure that she is well-fed. And not just well-fed with scraps, he feeds her exactly what they're eating. She, he makes sure that the meal that she's eating is tasty. He says, here, take some bread and dip it in the wine just like we are. Again, he doesn't withhold the good stuff from Ruth, but, but shares generously. He serves her. It says that he passed her the grain. So, Ruth, so Boaz is going out of his way to personally serve Ruth and make sure that she is fully satisfied enough that she has some left over. Again, it's extravagant generosity that we hear in that one verse. But it just keeps going. It just gets even more overwhelming than this. Verses 15 and 16, when she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her and also pull out some of the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. I just just imagine what the, the faces of the workers would have looked like. What what do you think they were thinking when when Boaz the boss says to them, listen here, I want you to let her come up and glean, not just from the things that are left on the stalks that we left untouched, the things that we overlooked, the leftover scraps, I want you to let her take from the grain that you just cut down. And in fact, do even more than that. Take all of that bundle of grain and pull out things from it and leave it on the ground for her to go pick back up. This is, this is an insane thing for a boss to say to the workers at that point in time. It's an absurd, it's an absurd request. As one scholar puts it, uh, it's a stunning, unheard of favor. If gleaning was reasonable generosity... Generosity within limits, Boaz just leaps well beyond any of those limits. There's just one word for how Boaz treats Ruth. It's grace. It's grace. Ruth has received the grace that she was looking for, and she knows it. Verse 13, then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord. I have found grace. But why? Why has Boaz treated Ruth with such overwhelming, abundant, astounding, extravagant grace? That's Ruth's question in verse 10. Why have I found favor in your eyes? Why have I found grace with you that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Boaz tells her, and his answer is beautiful. It really shows us a glimpse of what's in his own heart. Here's his answer in verse 11 and 12. All that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. 
and how you left your father and your mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So he's heard of Ruth's sacrifice. He understands what she's done, how she left everything, left her father, her mother, her family, her safety, her security, her gods, and came here into a foreign land in order to glean doing the work of someone in poverty, in order to take care of her Israelite widow, aging mother-in-law. She has made quite a sacrifice. Boaz is very aware of that. And then Boaz believes in his heart that God will bless people who sacrifice like that. We hear later on in the Bible, in Proverbs, the book of Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. Boaz believes that God will bless Ruth. And most importantly, Boaz thinks that he needs to take part in that blessing. Boaz believes that he is responsible for being an agent of God's blessing and generosity to Ruth. It's like this going on in his mind. She has come to Israel to find protection and blessing under the Lord's wings, and now she's come to my field. Apparently, God wants me to bless her. God wants to bless her through me. And I want you to think about that for a moment. Boaz believes that it's his job, his responsibility to participate in God's work of blessing a poor Moabite widow. Think about that for a minute. This is a good guy, right? This is a really good guy. This guy loves the Lord. This guy's imagination has been formed and shaped by God's grace. And now he's not thinking, what does the law tell me that I owe this person? Boaz is thinking, what can I do to bless this person? God wants to bless her through me. I'm supposed to show this person exactly how generous and gracious a God the Lord is? Well, how well can I do that? He actually seeks to just go above and beyond the letter of the law to show how gracious and wonderful our God is. This is a worthy man who acts worthily in every respect. We could absolutely apply that early 1990s salt and pepper song to him. What a man, what a man, what a man, what a mighty good man. From first to last, Boaz exhibits astounding grace. He is a mighty good man. And this is enough to get our hopes up. And that's exactly what happens next. Chapter two moves us from profound need to abundant grace, astounding grace, to rekindled hope. The story ends with rekindled hope. Ruth comes home with an abundance of food, an ephah of barley, probably close to 30 pounds of food, all in one day, plus leftovers, plus a guarantee that she can glean there for the rest of the season. Naomi is astounded. She asks, where did you get all this food? Who in the world let you glean all of this food from their field? And here is where the story comes together. Verse 19 is the big reveal. And so I just want you to imagine there's this drum roll in the background. Everything slows down. The camera zooms in. As you hear this, she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is... Boaz. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Boaz. You can just hear at that moment in time, Naomi's hope start to rise up within her. Boaz. Wait, he's my relative. Wait, he's one of our redeemers and he wants to provide for us like this. That means that he hasn't forgotten his duties to our family, to the larger clan. He hasn't forsaken the living and the dead. What kindness. 
What hesed, what love that goes beyond obligation in order to bless abundantly with this kind of kindness on display, maybe this won't end in emptiness. Maybe God is up to something. After all, there's no way that this can just be coincidence. The the text puts so much force and labor into uh, luck and chance that it only highlights God's providence. As Daniel Block says, the text practically screams, see the hand of God at work here. See the hand of God at work. So maybe there's hope. Maybe Boaz will be the redeemer. And that's where the text ends. That's where chapter two ends. It is still a cliffhanger. Still there's anticipation, still there's longing, but now there's hope. Chapter one made us long for a redeemer. Chapter two makes us long for a redeemer like Boaz. If there's going to be someone to rescue us, let it be someone like him. That's the longing that this text evokes in our hearts, and it applies to us equally. It is very clear that God's people were meant to personally identify with the characters in this story. Our redemption is caught up in their redemption. This story is our story. Their longings are our longings. Because we know need. We know scarcity. We know loneliness and anxiety. We know sin, and we know spiritual darkness. We know despair, and we long for someone who will take notice. We long for someone who will see all of our mess and who will be willing and able to enter into that mess with us and rescue us from it. We long for someone who can meet our profound need with abundant, astounding grace. We long for someone who can shine a light into our darkness and rekindle our hope. That's the longing of this Advent season, isn't it? We opened the service with that. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined, for unto us a child is born. Brothers and sisters, in God's kindness, we get to have a redeemer like Boaz, And his name is Jesus Christ. I think that's the point of Ruth chapter 2 for us. Ruth chapter 2 makes us long for a redeemer like Boaz, which then points us forward to great Boaz's greater grandson, Jesus Christ. Like Boaz, Jesus took notice when he saw the plight of the poor the marginalized, the socially insignificant, the spiritually suspect. He noticed them, and then he moved towards them in love. John 4, Jesus offers the Samaritan woman at the well with a dubious background. He offers her salvation. Matthew 8, Jesus touches the man with leprosy and heals him. Luke chapter 7, Jesus is called the friend of tax collectors and sinners. Matthew 8, or excuse me, Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus sees problems, sees need, and enters into it. He offers protection for the vulnerable. Romans 8, 39, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Jesus advocates for those in need. 1 John 2, 1, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Jesus showers the poor with his generosity. We've sung about it today. We heard it as our assurance of forgiveness, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Jesus comforts the sorrowful, 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself Comfort your hearts. 
Jesus Christ overflows with hesed, with kindness, loving kindness, a love that goes beyond obligation in order to bless abundantly. Galatians 2.20, but the life I live in the flesh, I live in the, the, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus is worthy. Amen? Jesus is worthy. Revelation 5.12, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Jesus Christ is an amazing savior. Everything that Boaz did for Ruth, Jesus Christ does for us in spades. He took on our human nature. He died for our sins. He rose again, guaranteeing us eternal life with God. He sits on the throne of heaven right now, overseeing our lives, protecting us, advocating for us, and he will come again to make all things new. Jesus will meet our profound need with astounding grace. Jesus is the light of the world, shining into our darkness so that we might have hope. Jesus is an amazing redeemer. He is an absolutely amazing redeemer so you can entrust yourself to him. You can give yourself over to him, bow down before him in awe at the grace that you've received. Take him at his word when he says that he wants to bless you. Cling to him. Cling to his people during your times of need and find refuge under his wings because he will never forsake you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this this gorgeous picture of Boaz, uh, which only shows us how astoundingly wonderful Jesus is. And we thank you that he has come, that our Redeemer has come. And we thank you that he will come again. And I pray now that through this word and through your spirit, you would impress this this image of how wonderful a Redeemer Christ is. I pray that you would push that deep into our hearts so that we would love Christ so that we would love you the way that Boaz clearly loved you. Give to us trust so that we would cling to you the way that Ruth did to Boaz's people. Give us faith to trust that you are for us and that you'll never leave us. Give us hope that you will come again and give us grace in the meantime so that we would, again, cling to you in faithfulness and love. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.